Hi, I'm John Allen of Bloomberg News, and welcome to the Bloomberg Google Hangout from the U.S. Africa Business Forum. We're going to be here all day, business and government leaders from the United States and Africa. And we are welcomed, uh, welcoming, uh, happy to have join us, Steve Cashin, uh, the CEO of Pan-African Capital, Capital Group. Uh, Steve, thanks for joining us. Thank You're you, leading John. off today, uh, set the table. Uh, for us a little bit in terms of uh, investment in Africa, uh, what's what's the continent look like today for investors versus five or ten years ago, and what do you think it's going to look like in a few years? Jonathan, they first of all, it. I want to thank Bloomberg Philanthropies, and I want to thank the administration for organizing this conference. I think this is a terrific testament to the opportunity that exists across Africa today, and now. to the opportunity that we are looking at in terms of the continent today for the future of investment. Uh, the opportunities across the continent are vast. You have a huge growing middle class. You have governments that are much better governed than they have ever been governed. Uh, and you have opportunities for American investors in the financial services industry in which we specialize, natural resources, many areas within the growing middle class, um, and a range of other um, opportunities uh, that just didn't exist on the continent in the past decade. So can you talk a little bit about, uh, uh, about that balance of resources versus the financial sector, infrastructure in terms of investment? Uh, I, one of the things that we've heard a lot coming into this conference is uh, that there's a movement uh, in, in some of the African countries to get away from uh, extractive uh, resources, and particularly, I think, for some investors to get away from extractive resources and more to technology, infrastructure, uh, financial services. So, Jonathan, getting away from extractive resources is difficult. Uh, if you have a continent that is driven by extractive resources, um, I think the issue is more how you leverage those extractive resources. The uh, Africa's, the drivers of the African economies are oil, mining, other natural resources. The issue is how you uh, enhance value for, for the products that are extracted and how you leverage the capital that you gain from those extractive industries in terms of building the economies across Africa. And I think you, start, you are starting to see that today in a way that you've never seen before where there's huge investment in education, there's huge investment in, uh, in the retail sector and, and manufacturing sector that did not exist before, and more than you've ever seen before, you've seen infrastructure investment today in a way that didn't exist over the past couple of decades, primarily in as much as, look as um, the types of investors in infrastructure are changing from the development finance community, which we have to thank uh, enormously for their continued support, but to the private investment community. And you see increasing names like your own, Bloomberg, at the table that just were not at the table before and who can be a huge, uh, huge asset in terms of growing the infrastructure that will be needed to grow the rest of the continent um, uh, over the next uh, generation. We see an Africa moving from very much the Africa of the nation state and the political state to broad-based regional economies, which are allowing for broader-based infrastructure investment over a number of countries. Uh, in addition, um, we're looking at the financial services industry, which, is, which has to have a more regional regulatory environment in order to grow. And the, the recognition that African states have of the need for, for regionalization in order to uh, reach scale is beginning to hit home. And in terms of that uh, stabilized regulatory environment, can you get specific with that? I mean, what, what safeguards need to be put in place uh, for that regional growth to occur and to be uh, managed in a responsible way? I think that there need, the, the, in, in, you've got, you know, 50 odd countries across the continent, 50 odd regulators across the continent, 50, and, and, and how many different, you know, members of parliament does that mean? Um, You've got a, an economy across the whole of the continent, which is the size of India's economy. Uh, but it's broken up into 54 different uh, nation states. Um, 
In order to really scale, I think you've got to look at regulation in the infrastructure space, in the financial services industries, and in other industries that standardize the way people invest and the way people operate. Uh, as it relates to the banking industry, um, the, the, there is no bank in Africa that is of the scale of any of the European banks. There are none of the banks that are in the top 100, even the largest banks. Uh, and there's no regional regulation uh, uh, of the financial services industry. The African Development Bank has begun to introduce um, uh, products that are more regional, um, uh, disciplines that are more regional, but they're not a regulator. Um, and the, uh, there's an opportunity for the African uh, leaders to begin to explore different core regulatory environments that could help to scale the rest of the continent. I want to talk to you a little bit about a couple of countries uh, in particular. Uh, I, I know that you're pretty familiar with Ellen, Ellen Sturleaf in uh, Liberia. Want to, uh, can you tell me a little bit about Liberia beyond what we're reading in the headlines today uh, about the uh, Ebola outbreak and uh, where Liberia is today versus uh, maybe, maybe 10 years ago or so when she came on the scene? Um, I was lucky enough to be hired by Ellen Johnson Sirleaf about 30 years ago when I worked for HSBC Equator, and she was, she was my boss uh, for many years. Um, um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf is the demonstration of the fact that leadership matters and democracy matters. Uh, she took over a failed state almost eight years ago. She has brought about a transformation that, that is, is quite spectacular. Um, she, children have all gone to school without seeing a gun for the last decade. Uh, there is investment in a range of different industries in Liberia that never had, uh, that did not exist for the past generation. U.S. companies, uh, ExxonMobil, one of their largest investments is in Liberia. Ourselves um, investing in the financial services industry. Um, this would not have happened without the leadership that Ellen Johnson Sirleaf brings. And she's bringing it in a very fragile state. Um, people have lived under the barrel of a gun for their whole lives. Um, and more recently you see the, this plague of Ebola, which is extremely difficult for a country like Liberia or the whole sub-region to be able to uh, deal with. But her leadership has brought a structure to dealing with this plague um, that I think will bring this under control within a very short period of time. And to be fair, the U.S. government has been enormously helpful in terms of assisting in that effort. If I can move across the continent, I know you're very familiar with Tanzania. I think you served as a Peace Corps volunteer there uh, many years ago. Tell me a little bit about Tanzania's development. It uh, seems to be one of, those, uh, one of those growing areas. Tanzania is one of the largest countries in Africa. It has the potential to be both a breadbasket for Africa as well as a natural resource basket for Africa. Um, it, it's, it is located sort of on the east coast with a terrific coastline uh, and um, is part of the East African community. Uh, again, Tanzania, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, more and more into Ethiopia have a potential to scale up in a way that they, their economies can grow enormously. Um, I think that Tanzania's growth really is stymied by politics. Um, and as you focus more on the economics versus the politics, you're going to see uh, considerably more growth. And uh, one last thing uh, for the, maybe a little bit more for the American audience is uh, you uh, sit, if I'm not mistaken, on the uh, board of uh, the Georgetown Foreign Service School. Um, what, are, what are today's Foreign Services officers like compared to the past? Where is that headed? It seems like there's been some, some transition over the years into how we train our Foreign Service officers. I don't know who got you to ask this question, but the focus of my role on the board of Georgetown's um, uh, Board of Visitors um, is to introduce a, um, um, uh, a new way of training our Foreign Service officers and a new way of training our uh, young people engaged in international affairs. Georgetown has recently launched something uh, uh, called the Global Human Development Program. The Global Human Development Program, which is led by a close friend of mine, Steve Radlett, um, is uh, a program which 
has a more applied training for our foreign service officers and other officers who are uh, other young people who are going to be working in international affairs, where they are trained not only as economists and political scientists, but more practical, defined training, where they have finance background, accounting background, and more specialized training, so they understand more specific targeted areas that can be applied globally. The, um, um, and so we're looking at an area where being a total generalist I don't think works anymore. Um, I was brought up as the son of a foreign service officer, and I think we're, work we're living in a very different world. Um, and so apply, uh, focusing on more targeted training in both financial services as well as other, uh, sorry, financial and administrative services as well as uh, the broad-based economics and political science uh, will prepare our young people uh, for the future a whole lot better. And we'll all get to see how that works out. Steve Cash, and CEO of the Pan-African Capital Group, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll be back soon with more from the U.S.-Africa Business Summit and the Bloomberg Google Hangout.